In this video, we'll explore a wide input isolated DC to DC converter project. This design is based on a flyback topology and provides two independent isolated outputs. It's uh, capable of operating from a very wide input range between 50 volts and 300 volts DC, which makes it suitable for applications where the input voltage can vary significantly. The author is Esa Moshiri, who holds an MSc in Embedded Systems Design and has extensive experience in electronic design and digital marketing. He also runs the YouTube channel MyVanitar, where he shares electronic projects, design techniques and measurement tips. Welcome on board, friends. This is an isolated DC to DC converter board with three outputs based on the flyback topology. The input voltage range is quite wide, from 50 to 300 volts. It has three outputs. Let me show you. These are the outputs, 5 volts, 3.3 volts, each capable of supplying 500 milliamps continuously. And the third one is 15 volts, which is fully isolated from the other two and regulated independently. It can provide up to 300 milliamps continuously. All right, this is the PCB project of this power supply. And here is the schematic diagram. And this one is the PCB layout. Let me start to explain the schematic from this edge and this DC input. This is a common mode choke for noise reduction. And as you see, I placed the ground reference at the exit point of this common mode choke. This fuse for, prote for protection, this NTC to limit the inrush current, this capacitor is to reduce the high frequency noises, this capacitor is to reduce the ripple. These two series resistors provide the initial startup current for the controller, this IC3. These components, I mean these three resistors, this capacitor and this diode belong to the stubber circuit to protect this MOSFET Q1 against high voltage spikes and ringings on the primary of the transformer. This is the main purpose of using a snubber. However, if the snubber is designed properly, it reduces the conducted emission also. After the startup process, we have to supply the controller by another method because the uh, operation current of the controller is higher than the startup current. So we have to use an auxiliary winding on the transformer. Then this diode rectifies the AC voltage of the auxiliary. These two capacitors reduce the noise and ripple of the voltage. And this Zener diode is to ensure that this voltage on the supply rail does not go higher than 24 volts because if this voltage goes higher than 30, I think, for this controller, it will activate the self-protection feature of this controller and the output will be turned off because it stops the switching. Uh, this resistor defines the switching frequency of the controller, which is 65 kilohertz. So I explained the primary side, let's go to the secondary. On the secondary, we have two outputs, actually three outputs, but uh, uh, the third one is derived from this output. So I can say two outputs. This output is controlled or regulated using this optocoupler because this optocoupler senses the voltage variations at this output and regulate it using the feedback loop of the controller. However, this output is totally isolated from this one and it is not on the feedback loop. So we have to regulate it independently using this buck converter. I selected this buck converter chip, MP4560. It's a nice chip uh, and efficient. 
So except for the input, which is a typical uh, high frequency rectifier circuit using this Schottky diode, the rest is a buck converter chip. You can adjust the output voltage by modifying these two feedback resistors. So nothing very much here. And this side, this, uh, this secondary, so again, a typical a high frequency rectification using this diode and this CLC or Pi filter. We get the five volts output from here and then I use a linear type regulator or in a better term an LDO type regulator to get 3.3 volts output from this five volts. That's why I said actually we have two secondaries because this 3.3 is derived from this five volts. And this LED to indicate that we have a proper voltage level at the output and is to show that the power supply works properly. This is a Y capacitor for noise reduction, of course. So I think I covered everything. If you have any question regarding this schematic, just leave your opinion in the comments. Let's go to the PCB. So this is a two layer PCB for both the primary and the secondary side. Let me explain the designing techniques I followed for this layout. The first and maybe the most important one is this trace. I mean the trace between the drain pin of the MOSFET and the primary of the transformer. This trace should be short and wide because it contains wild switching currents. It can easily act as an antenna, a good candidate for high radiated emission. The next trick is the snubber. The snubber circuit should be placed as close as possible to the transformer. And I personally suggest to use SMD type resistors for the snubber because I experienced its good effect on the waveform of the snubber. I show you the waveform of the snubber in the next step. If you can use SMD type for the capacitor, is also fine, but I suggest you to at least use SMD type for the snubber resistor. The next point is this loop from the positive, positive pin of the Schottky diode to the ground pin of the first capacitor here. This loop should be as small as possible. It has a significant effect on the output noise. So for this purpose, try to place the ground pin of the first capacitor as close as possible to the ground pin of the transformer or use very low impedance path between these two pins as you see here. The same thing happens here. This is the Schottky diode to the first capacitor and here is the ground pin of the capacitor and this is the ground pin of the transformer because for this secondary uh, you would not solder the ground pin of the winding on the bobbin. Instead, the wires comes out from the bobbin and is soldered directly on the PCB. The next trick is using copper planes instead of tracks for high current areas or high current PCB passes like what you see here. So don't use narrow tracks for high current uh, PCB areas or high current passes because it will uh, because narrow tracks will introduce voltage drops and it affect the performance of your power supply. The next trick is using thermal relief on the capacitor's pins where it's necessary because the Schottky diode and the inductor uh, will dissipate heat in high currents and this heat is transferred to the capacitors using this copper plane. So you should use thermal relief on the capacitor's pins and to protect the capacitors against this uh, heat because heat is an enemy for the capacitors. 
it reduces the lifetime of capacitors dramatically. I can say heat is a poison for the capacitors. Be careful about this. So the, the same thing happens here. You see the thermal relief. The last point is the grounding. So you see the ground doesn't have any loop. If I show you the bottom layer, the bottom layer is almost a solid ground plane. This is very useful to, redu to reduce the length and impedance of the ground path. The minimum benefit of this is to reduce the output noise and radiated emission. The, set the same thing happens on the primary side, you see? For the same reason, I use these many vias or vias to reduce the length and impedance of the ground path. So, using all of these techniques, you can ensure that your power supply circuit works properly. Let's go to the next step. Alright, here are some details about the fried core, bobbin and winding pattern. The picture on the left shows the fried core I used. It's an E25-137 type and the bobbin is a horizontal 5 plus 5 pin style. The picture on the right shows the winding pattern and the estimated gap size. The dot symbol marks the starting point of each winding that follows the primary. For example, the primary winding consists of 31 turns using a single strand of 0.5 mm magnet wire. On the secondary side, the ground wire exits the transformer and is soldered directly to the PCB. I assume you already know how to wind a transformer, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. Alright, welcome to the test bench. I have prepared this test setup to test this power supply board. I am recording this video using my cell phone, that's why it shakes a little bit. I don't have access to a high voltage DC power supply, so I use this variable AC transformer to prepare the AC voltage and then rectify it using this bridge rectifier. You can see the wiring and then uh, apply this DC voltage to the input and the input is monitored using this multimeter, the sigillant one, so the input voltage is around 50 volts. And the output is under load using these two DC loads. So this DIY DC loads, DC load apply 300 milliamps to this output and this signal DC load applies one amp to this five volts output because the 3.3 volts output comes directly from the five volts using this linear regulator. So when I apply one amp, it means 500 milliamps for the 5 volts and 500 milliamps for the 3.3 volts output. So, as you see, the output, all of the outputs are pretty stable. Now I increase the voltage to 300 to test the upper limit. So I increase the voltage. So this is AC. As I said, this is the DC at the input, show you again, I should go at least 220, I'm sure, so yes, let's go to 300, and there we go, almost 300 volts, this output, and this output, the circuit works flawlessly. All right, for the next test, I will examine the spikes and ringing on the primary of the transformer when the input voltage is at its maximum level, which is 300 volts DC for this circuit, to see the effect of the snubber and if the snubber does the job properly. So I use this Mixic high voltage differential probe to sense the input. So this is the input side. 
and here is the oscilloscope side. The DC loads applies the maximum load to the output, 1 amp and 300 milliamps, and here is the results, worst case scenario, and the measurement says the maximum peak-to-peak -peak voltage is around 540 volts, which stays well below the maximum drain source voltage of the MOSFET. Now, the first test is passed. Now I'm going to check the behavior of the ringing, if we see any sharp edges on this ringing. And as you see, there is no sharp edge on this ringing at the edge of the pulse. So there is no high frequency uh, elements in this waveform and the snubber does the job perfectly. So this is a good supply, just build one and have fun.